They are responsible for the laid-back Silicon Valley working style. Everyone was on a first-name basis. There were no reserve parking places, no offices, only cubicles. It's still true today. Here's the chairman's cubicle. Knock, knock. Yeah. I, I, I knock on the door, but there's yeah. no door. <laughs> Gordon Moore is one of the Intel founders uh, worth $3 billion. Yeah, With money like that, I'd have a door. In a business like this, uh, the people with the power are the ones that have the understanding of what's going on, not necessarily the ones on top. It's very important that those people that have the knowledge uh, are the ones that make the decisions. Intel's microprocessors, they soon had enough horsepower to run a whole computer. Only Intel didn't appreciate the brilliance of their own product, seeing it as useful mainly for calculators or traffic lights. Intel had all the elements necessary to invent the PC business, but they just didn't. Intel had all the elements necessary to invent the PC business, but they just didn't get it. Lucky for us, someone did. This is the chip that launched the personal computer revolution. This is the magazine that announced it. In January 1975, featured on the cover was the world's first personal computer, the Altair 8800. It was the crazy idea of an ex-Air Force officer from Georgia, Ed Roberts. If you look at it, you know, it was kind of a grandiose, uh, almost megalomaniac uh, kind of scheme, you know. Uh, and right now, I couldn't do it because I could see right off there's no way you could do this. There isn't any way you could do this. But at that time, you know, we just lacked the, uh, the benefits of age and experience. We didn't know we couldn't do it. Twenty years after Ed Roberts' flash of brilliance, this exhibit is being held to celebrate the anniversary of the Altair. Like every other PC pioneer, Ed built his computer just because he wanted one to play with. There were some of us that lusted after computers, really, at that time. All the computers in the world tended to be in big centers, and you had to get permission to get close to them, and it was, a, you know, you just, nobody could, nobody had access to computers then. And the idea that you could have your own computer and do whatever you wanted to with it, whenever you wanted to, was fantastic. Within a month after it was introduced, we were getting 250 orders a day. Started about six the Altair wasn't even a computer. It was a computer kit. Whoa, this is a pretty well-equipped machine. You had to build it yourself, and even then, it usually didn't work. Still, the so demand was amazing. Is, and there were actually people that came to MITS, a couple people with camper trailers and camped out in the parking lot waiting for their machines. I mean, they were so eager. This is an Altair computer, the first personal computer. And not just any Altair. This is Altair serial number two, the second one made. The first Altair made was sent off to be photographed at a magazine and was lost in the mail. So this is the oldest personal computer in the world. Pretty historic junk. But the question is, what do you do with it? I mean, it, it has a front panel with switches that you can click back and forth and some lights. But in the back, there's no place to connect a keyboard. There's no place to connect a monitor. There's no place to connect a printer. In fact, there's practically nothing at all that you can really do with this thing. But back then, 1975, the people who had it were thrilled. The nerds formed clubs to talk about their new toy. One of the first was the Homebrew Computer Club, which met on Wednesday evenings in a hall rented from Stanford University in Silicon Valley. Presiding over near anarchy was Lee Felsenstein, who pretended to be in charge. I would start the meeting by making a horrendous loud noise because everyone was talking and I had to get some attention somehow. And I would use it to call on the person in question. I would make threatening gestures with it. Most of us were in the electronics industry to a certain extent. There was also a stratum of physicians. And there were a lot of radio amateurs, for instance, finding a new technology that wasn't stale. But most of us were at a sort of middle level downwards. We saw ourselves as crazed 
ignored geniuses or possibly geniuses, but at least we could each hope to get our hands on a computer of our own. <laughs> the very uselessness of the Altair is what drove the hobbyists together. Roger Mellon and Harry Garland started an early computer company. They came here to meet others and to figure out just what the heck could be done with this new toy. A solution in search of a problem. There's no keyboard that I can see. The Altair was tedious to use. At first, the only way that data and instructions could be given to the computer was by flipping switches. Take something trivial like two plus two. Each two needed eight different switches to be flipped. Then a ninth switch was used to load them all. Add required another nine switches. The answer four was if the third light from the left turned on. Eureka! So if you had a program that was 100 bytes long, you had to go through this procedure 100 times to load that into memory. It took a long time. I bet it did. And what happened if you lost power or you lost your way in the middle? You cried. <laughs> <laughs> the Altair made This was called a basic interpreter. But it didn't yet exist because the experts all thought that not even basic was basic enough to fit inside the tiny Altair memory. Yet again, the experts were wrong. Here comes the guy who solved the problem. 20 years after finishing the first... Berlin co-founded Microsoft thanks, with his thanks, younger David. buddy from high school, Bill Gates. One day in Boston, I was in Harvard Square, and I covered popular electronics with this thing that looked like what I'd been imagining. And so I grabbed it off the shelf, I looked at it, and I bought it, and I you know, ran back to Bill's dorm. And I think he was probably playing poker that night and usually losing money at that point. Um, <coughs> one of the few times when that's been... Case. Uh, uh, then, okay, here was a company that would be needing software. And you know, he said, okay, well, we, we got call, we got to call these guys up and see if this thing is for real. We realized that things were starting to happen. And just because we'd had a vision for a long time of where this chip could go, what it could mean, uh, that didn't mean the industry was going to wait for us while I stayed and, and finished my degree at Harvard. So called up Ed, you know, we told him, we, we, we've got this basic, and it's just, you know, for your machine, it's, you know, it's, it's not that far from being done, and we'd like to come out and show it to you. So we created this basic interpreter. Paul took the paper tape uh, and, and flew out. In fact, the night before, he, he got some sleep while I double-checked everything to make sure that we had, uh, had it all right. But I had no idea what it was really going to be like to, to try to run the software. It had never been run on, a, on an actual... Uh, computer before. He was very nervous about whether this would actually work and he got to the office and we all gathered around and he put the, his fingers on the switches and he uh, loaded basic in with paper tape into the Altair. You know, I was just, I was so nervous. I just, this is just, not, it's not going to work. Not, it worked. And it came up and it could do a few little simple things. He joined Alan in what was then the center of world microcomputing research among the sleazy bars and gas stations of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they lived across the street from Mitz in the Sundowner Motel. And the, the prostitutes and the drug dealers seek for the Altair computer. And uh, gradually they actually started Microsoft here in Albuquerque. So We hired uh, some, some of our uh, high school friends basically to come down and uh, uh, stay with us in our apartment, which became very crowded. And so he just had a lot of, a lot of energy. They worked really hard. They uh, listened to really loud music. I could hardly stand to go in the software room sometimes because the music would be banging off the walls, mostly acid rock. Uh, you know, we usually go out, eat, eat pizzas, and then go out and watch uh, action movies. Uh, <laughs> It was a wild time. It was a very exciting time. And the, the first user convention where we got people to come in and tell us what they were doing, what they were excited about. And other companies like Processor Technology or MSI or Comemco got going as add-on companies. These companies are long forgotten, but they were the, the humble beginnings of the, of the PC industry.